Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel, or if you're new here, hello, my name is Brittany. <laughs> I'm a new dentist. This video is very special because I have here with me my new friend, Jessica, and she is an orthodontist. Um, I know many of you Black Pals are very interested in ortho. Perhaps that was your first experience with dentistry, or I know a lot of you are, really aspire to be orthodontist, so I thought what a great way and to invite an orthodontist um, to answer some of your most common questions. So the first question, just kind of like to get to know you a little better, Jessica, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. So uh, I live in Irvine, California. Um, I was born and raised actually in Niagara Falls, Ontario, which is in Canada. Um, I did my dental school at the University of Louisville, which is in Kentucky, and then I went straight straight into orthodontic residency at Loma Linda, and I graduated 10 months ago, and I've been working here ever since. Awesome. That's so yeah. great. I, I thought you were working for longer than that, but... No, it's been only wow. like 10 months. Yeah, wow, just, that's yeah. cool. Okay, so I guess like the biggest question that people want to know is like, why did you choose ortho, and kind of when did you decide to go into it? Okay, um, I made the decision in dental school... Um, in dental school, you don't really get much experience with ortho, um, so I was busy just trying to learn as much as I can with general dentistry. Um, I think it wasn't until like third year when we did the rotations for the di different specialty clinics when um, I had the chance to shadow uh, the orthodontic clinic. Um, over there, I just noticed that the interactions with patients were a little different. Obviously, the patients, they were really excited to be there. Um, they were enthusiastic about, and they were able to notice the changes um, that we were making in their mouths. And so there's just a different kind of vibe there. Um, everyone seemed so positive. The environment was so pleasant. And so I thought that, you know, that's the kind of lifestyle I wanted for the rest of my life. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, and it's definitely true. Um, it does seem that in dental school, ortho is kind of like very elusive. And we're just like, what's going on? I don't know what it was like in Louisville, but um, for Louisville. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you're thinking of Louisville. They kind of just like blended uh -huh. the letters uh -huh. together. Got it right. Yeah, good. Um, so kind of after you decided that, hey, this is kind of the field that I want to go to, what was the process like applying to residency? So the process is very similar to applying to dental school. Um, you basically apply to the schools that you want to attend, you interview. Um, the only difference is um, instead of choosing where you, uh, from your acceptances where you want to go, um, the residencies, most of them are part of a match system. So you basically rank the programs and the pro programs rank you and then there's a match day where um, you're basically told where where you end up so it's kind of like a, a matchmaking process basically, <laughs> essentially so mm -hmm. um, there are some residencies that aren't uh, part of the match for instance I went to Loma Linda which is a non-match school um, and then typically for those schools they uh, will have their interviews and they'll um, make their decision before match day um, so then if that happens and you've, if you're given a spot, you have to decide if you want to drop out of the match and accept that mm -hmm. position. So at the end of the day, if you're going to apply to a non-match school, it better be one of the, the schools that are top of your list because then you forfeit your chances of um, the other schools on your match list. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, you would essentially, they, the, the application process is a year before the program start date. So I started my application the summer before fourth year. Mm -hmm. And you have to, just like the AdSAS portal, mm -hmm. there's something called the pass, and then of course the match. And then you prepare your personal statement, um, letters of rec. You have to uh, you know, do some supplemental applications. Um, you have to take the GRE for some programs. Mm -hmm. And the year I was applying, there was a new test called the Advanced DAT. Mm -hmm. So there's just a, it's a little different for every school, but mm -hmm. it's basically the same game. Just, okay. just like possible. Okay. Yeah. So did you end up taking the GRE or the uh, Advanced DAT? I took both of them. Oh. There is an advantage because then um, some schools, you know, if there's a lot of requirements, um, 
there's a smaller pool of applicants. So that's mm -hmm. how I decided um, to mm -hmm. apply. I don't know. That's kind of yeah. Like, interesting. She I went above and beyond. Everyone. <laughs> she took two yeah. tests. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, um, I know I have a lot of um future orthodontists listening in, watching in, oh, but um, <laughs> I know like um one of their another one of their big questions is like how can they, I guess, beef up their application or like what kind of extracurriculars or shadowing or what do they need to do? Mm. So um, definitely showing an interest in orthodontics. I shadowed a lot in the school's clinic, got to know um, how it works, how a clinical setting works. Um, I also shadowed uh, private orthodontists in the area. Um, I was part of their orthodontic study club. Um, yeah, just, um, just really knowing that you want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, research is a big factor, too. I know a lot of interviews, they ask me, do you have any research experience? Mm -hmm. Because um, most residencies make you complete a master's degree. Mm -hmm. So you have to choose a research project, and you have to show some kind of interest in that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's basically it. Do your, do your best academically. Mm -hmm. um, strive for the best you be. GPA you can achieve yeah. um, in ranking as well. It helps to have a higher rank. Mm -hmm. so. And um, I know you probably don't know like for the ranking, but would you know like a general ballpark for people to shoot for? Oh, I heard so many things. Yeah, and me too. <laughs> now, being, now being in the program, I know some people have mentioned that, oh, they didn't have that high of a rank, but they expressed mm -hmm. so much interest and passion for ortho. Mm -hmm. But it really all depends, I think, cumulatively, like mm -hmm. like who you are makes a huge difference in yeah. um, how strong you are of a candidate. So I think you're pretty, I don't want to say you're safe <laughs> if you're like top 10, uh -huh. but I mean... It really all depends. You obviously want to do the best you can. Mm -hmm. I think kind of just like showing up and poking your head in there and being like, hey, it's me. I'm interested. I think exactly. that would really help. So what was residency like? Um, residency, it's it's quite different from dental school just because oh. you have a lot more responsibilities. Um, you're obviously a doctor, so you have a little bit more independence and... Um, yeah, like when you interact with faculty, they kind of treat you like a colleague. It's not like a um, like a teacher-student relationship. Um, but yeah, like you have, especially ortho, because ortho is unique in the fact that there's so many different ways to treat a patient, and you can be creative with your mechanics. So you just have a lot of freedom in residency. And plus, the mm -hmm. also another factor is the um, class size is very small. Um, in Louisville, it was 120 students, mm -hmm. and in uh, Loma Melinda, it was a class size of six. Mm -hmm. So you get to know everyone very closely. It becomes like your second family. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of classes that you would take. Like it's broken down to didactic and clinical. Um, in the beginning of the program, it's a lot, obviously a lot more didactic classes. Um, just learn the foundation, like like biomechanics growth and development, treatment planning, um, and then you have some wire bending classes and you learn how to make some appliances. Um, yeah, but then later on you get more clinical um, clinic time and then you um, have time to do research because you have to complete that thesis and the, and the master's component of the program. Yeah, interesting. So um, how many years or months is, is the program usually? Um, it's usually two to three years. There are some programs that are one year. Those are very, um, wow, I didn't know that <laughs> number, but yeah, let's lucky for them. After residency and graduation, you know, you're a licensed, um, orthodontist. So like, what was a typical day like as an orthodontist before COVID-19 and after oh, COVID-19? <laughs> <laughs> so typically we would see about 50 on average 50 patients wow. per day yeah and then I know in one of my um, higher volume offices we would sometimes see double the amount on one of our busiest days um, but yeah I work in three different offices so it's a little different um, but typically we would 
you know, see the patient, address their any emergencies like broken brackets, pokey wires, um, and then we would just evaluate where they are in um, orthodontic treatment. Um, what I would decide what kind of adjustments they would need, and then I would communicate that with the assistant, um, and then they would make those adjustments. It would usually be a change of wire, um, bending the wire, changing the configuration of their rubber bands, mm -hmm. um, replacing brackets. And then for new patient consults, we just get to know the patients and their family. Um, and then we provide treatment plans and mm -hmm. we go from there. But yeah, mm -hmm. after COVID, it was completely like, it threw us all into a frenzy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just the schedule slowed down so much. Um, we're probably seeing about half the patients now. We just want to make sure everyone's working in a very safe environment. Um, everyone takes their temperature once, once they get into the office. There's a questionnaire to see if you have any symptoms or if you've been in contact with someone with COVID. Um, we're an open bay setting, so now everyone's like every other chair. Mm -hmm. Everyone's in every other chair with barriers, with little walls that we put up. Um, and so we have all the PPE that we need to see patients, and it's, it's slowed down a lot. But mm -hmm. we just want to make sure everyone's safe and working in a healthy environment. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's so crazy that it's like half the people coming in. Um, do they come in for like, regular like monthly checkup stuff or is it just for emergency uh right now one of my offices it's just emergency only mm -hmm. and then the other offices are um business as usual except for those other measures that we're taking mm -hmm. um in place for yeah yeah interesting mm -hmm. and then back in the good old days 2019 <laughs> um, yeah. when you would see like 50 to 100 patients like how is that possible was it just like go 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 or kind of yeah, yeah. Um, that's something I wasn't really um, prepared for once I got out of residency mm -hmm. I didn't realize how dependent we are on our um, clinical staff like the assistants basically do the majority of the adjustments um, so it's really important to know how to communicate what you want um, want done for um, the adjustment to the assistant. Um, in residency, we did every little thing, we did all the adjustments, oh. we made sure everything was, you know, to a T. Um, and then it almost became kind of like routine, a little bit like, in like instinct. But then you forget to mention, oh, like, make sure you do this, make sure you do that to the assistant. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have to realize that, like, a patient, unlike residency, can't be there for an hour mm -hmm. every single month. So yeah. um, you just have to learn how to become more efficient. And um, I had to tweak a lot of those, those things in my protocol once I got out mm -hmm. of school. Mm -hmm. wow. But yeah, you, it's only possible with the support of your staff. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. I can't even imagine seeing all of those people and doing the adjustments by yourself. That's that's, that's insane. Better. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, and then, what would you say is the most challenging part about being an orthodontist? Um, that was hard because I don't really run into a lot of difficult times. I think um, the one thing is understanding the business aspect of orthodontics. That's something I wasn't really prepared for. Um, or they don't, they didn't really teach us a lot of that in residency or even dental school. So just understanding insurances, um, it doesn't really affect you at all, but just when you hear the lingo and stuff going around in the office, you just want to be aware of that and like educate yourself. So, um, I think that is the thing that I felt really, like I had no previous knowledge on. And so I had to learn that in practice. Um, cool. Yeah. I do wish that at school they would teach us more about that kind of stuff. We're, we're right. really spoiled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I should have paid attention more into practice. Management. I know. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> Is there kind of like um, one case that you remember that was like super complicated or where the patient had like a very severe case? Um, a lot of, um, patients are referred from the Children's Hospital in Orange mm -hmm. County that I see. Um, some of them are, you know, they have conditions like cleft palate, mm -hmm. um, like hemifacial microsomia. So cases where I have to um, brainstorm and um, work with other specialties, they could be a little bit complicated. Um, but then 
those are the cases that are also very like rewarding and mm -hmm. fun to treat, but those are cases that you don't see, you know, all the time every day. So I think those, those are probably the ones that, you know, have to think a little bit harder for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Especially like with working with other professionals too, because sometimes I feel like with dentistry and maybe ortho, like it feels so isolating, like you're in this little bubble. Yeah, <laughs> but, it definitely does. Mm -hmm. Do you think, or like how saturated is ortho right now? I hear that a lot. Just like everywhere mm -hmm. is saturated. Mm -hmm. All the places like um, where people want to live in, like mm -hmm. LA, Orange County, um, they kept telling me like, oh, you want to think twice about practicing here because you'll probably have a hard time finding a job. But in reality, all the people that I've known, like my upperclassmen, my um, colleagues, they all have found jobs like mm -hmm. full time. So mm -hmm. I think you just have to be open minded about the opportunities that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can learn and grow as a dental professional in any setting, I think. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think people shouldn't worry too much and you shouldn't let that scare you. Because yeah. you, will, you will be employed. Don't worry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I hope that's the same thing with general dentistry. Yeah. <laughs> and another question we have is how do you feel about Smile Direct Club? <laughs> oh my gosh. It's the tea. So, um, yeah, this is, um, I think like if you're, if you're, trying to seek orthodontic treatment, you really have to be careful. You have to make sure it's monitored by um, a dental professional. Um, you, like, you need someone that knows what they're doing in order to know how to move your teeth. Mm -hmm. um, at the, at, if not, you're basically risking you know, the health of your teeth, not only your teeth, but your jaws, your, um, just the way you function when you bite. Mm -hmm. So at the very least, like when you want orthodontic treatment, you need a proper diagnosis, proper treatment plan, and those can only be done if, you know, you're seeing someone in real life, mm -hmm. they're assessing your teeth, the mobility of your teeth, um, and that's the only way you can tell if, you know, your health, your teeth are healthy to move um, in alignment. Um, otherwise, you might face you know, irreparable damage to your health and your teeth and that's how people lose teeth <laughs> and um, at the very least a panoramic x-ray clinical exam mm -hmm. a CEF, you know you can see if you have short roots um, and if we start moving teeth with short roots there's a risk of them falling out essentially and you having implants mm -hmm. um, things like pathology are missed um, supernumerary teeth there are teeth that are there yeah. that you don't even realize mm -hmm. you had extra teeth um, impacted teeth like and and also like shifts like you would never catch that um through pictures alone so mm -hmm. i think you just have to be very careful when um you're seeking treatment from these companies because you may be facing more issues and complications mm -hmm. than you originally had <laughs> <laughs> then um kind of another question that somebody asked is what do you see or like the possible advancements in orthodontics in the next 10 years? Um, I think a big thing right now is like 3D printing, making things customized. So I'm um, seeing a lot of people like doing their own aligners. Um, lingual orthodontics is a huge thing now because um, it's, if anything, it's a little bit more aesthetic than um, aligners because you can't really see anything because it's on the lingual surfaces mm -hmm. of your teeth. Um, so that's big. I think just being like customized, I think is the big thing. Um, CBCT, uh, incorporating that into your treatment planning is big as well. Um, yeah. yeah, just things are getting like more digital mm -hmm. and um, technology is advancing mm -hmm. a lot, so. So hopefully everything will be more convenient yeah. in, de in dentistry <laughs> in general. <laughs> Do you ever wish that you've picked a different specialty or stayed in general dentistry? At first, I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to be doing a crown prep or a class mm -hmm. two again in my entire life. Um, and like the last time I've done a class two was during reps, which mm -hmm. was like, <laughs> so three years ago, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't placed a rubber dam on for three years. Um, but yeah, in the beginning, I was 
I felt a little sad because I was like, oh, I loved crown preps like during dental school. Mm -hmm. um, but as, as I started learning orthodontics more and more, I got more passionate um, about learning how to diagnose and treatment plan better and just being creative with mechanics. The more you get like into it, like the more I never like looked back. <laughs> because in orthodontics, it's just, it's almost kind of like a game where like you get really into it, kind of like how once you start learning chess, some people get really into it. They mm -hmm. want to know all the tips and tricks, uh, video games, sports. So. Mm -hmm. Um, there are times though when I see like a heavy calculus and I just like wish I like could grab all my <laughs> pillars and start doing SRPs, but um, I leave that to um, my referrals, the mm -hmm. general dentist, and they do a really good job with cosmetic bonding and mm -hmm. um, any, any work that needs to be done for my patients. So. Yeah. The last question that I have for you is what do you think is like the most rewarding part about being an orthodontist? Um, I think it's like really cool at the very end of treatment for kids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're obviously grown up a bit more, but they see their pictures and they compare it from before and after. And you can tell like in the beginning they had like, you know, teeth that they weren't happy about and they're younger and then they've grown into um, like young adults who are obviously more confident. Um, I think just seeing that transformation and um, their reaction when they see themselves in the mirror for the first time it's like mm -hmm. it's re it's really rewarding yeah you did something good for them yeah so. oh that's great yeah. thank you so much for joining us here today oh, sure. um yeah. we're so honored to have you here <laughs> thank you jessica for being here if you guys have any uh, specific questions for her feel she has given us permission to dm her on instagram so i'll leave um her handle here on the bottom and also a link to her Instagram too, as well on the description. Nice. Yeah, thank you thanks. so much for the opportunity. Yay. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>